Hi, everyone. Again, another guest, and I'm so excited because I have learned so much about so many things with all these guest appearances. And this is a whole new concept that I didn't know about. And I can't wait for you to hear about it as well. And it's called sensory interior design. And so I have my guest is Carolyn Fetter Gold. And she is an expert in this. And I'm just going to let her introduce herself and then tell us all about what this means. And then I'm going to think up some questions and put those in whenever we need to. So Carolyn, it's so good to have you. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here with you. Well, thank you for joining us. So tell us what is sensory interior design? Because I think everyone knows what interior design is, but what is sensory interior design? Sensory interior design is something I, whether I dreamed it up or it was given to me, is really how all the elements that surround us affect us. So I'll say what it affects, and then I can explain more what those elements are. But it affects your sleep. It Mm. uh, affects how you think, how you do your homework, how you are at work, how you eat, how you relax, and even how you play, which is basically our whole lives, right? Yes, everything. Everything. So, Well, I have so many teens that don't sleep well or... And I always just attributed it to them being on their phones too much or, which I think is certainly a distraction, but if they are not sleeping well, what's an example of something in the interior design that could be affecting their sleep? Well, I have one example that comes to mind. There's a woman that I know and she called me and she was crying and she said, I've really reached my limit. I don't know what to do for my daughter anymore. She's depressed. She's not sleeping. She's not eating. And she's going to therapy. And like, she gave me this whole list and and my heart was breaking. And she said, could you come over and maybe you have some insight on what's going on? So before I went into her room, I have a sensory assessment which is Mm -hmm. like this. It's called, who are you? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I do love that. Are you? (laughs) Because I feel we're all like variations. We're a spectrum of variations on the theme. And Mm -hmm. it just asks a lot of censored questions that you may not even be aware of about yourself. So a lot of people go, wow, I never knew this about myself. So before I, first, my client is really the room but I have to get answers from the person that occupies it. Mm -hmm. So this girl at the time was like 15, 16. And so after she gave me the assessment, I didn't read it because I read it later on. And the minute she opened her door, I went, whoa. (laughs) I totally get this poor girl, my goodness. So while she was away at camp, one year, her mom, as a gift, surprised her and painted her room. Didn't ask her what she wanted. The mom figured this is going to be a cool color. And with time, this daughter started putting things on her walls to cover up the color. Mm. And the more she put on her walls, the more crazy it was getting because there was so much on the walls. When I asked her, Later on, I said, whatever you tell me just stays between us. And she said, I don't want to hurt my mom's feelings, but Mm. I hate it. I hate Mm -hmm. it. So she had a dog cage, an enormous dog cage, because she had um, like a a therapy dog. Mm. The cage was enormous. And that was in place of her nightstand. She didn't have a bed. Her mattress was on the floor. Oh my gosh, my heart is mm-hmm. beating just thinking. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was overloaded just walking in. So sensory overload and interior design go hand in hand. It's really things that are screaming. My favorite term is visual noise. So mm-hmm. imagine somebody banging a pan. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very, very disturbing. So we all perceive visual noise differently. It could be from an auditory standpoint, textural, it it varies. So 
Well, in that example, you were saying she didn't yeah. like the color. Do you ever come across people who are having trouble learning or relaxing or resting, sleeping, and you see the room and you're like, oh my gosh. And they're like, I love this room. I love it exactly the way it is. And yet it's not working for them at all. And so if you did have that, and it looks like you, you're saying yes, and I want you to tell the story about that, but, but then how do you convince someone that the way something is arranged or what they, how they have things put is, even though they like it, is not in their best interest to have? That's a great <laughs> scenario because it happens. And first of all, they've invited me over for a reason. So something mm -hmm. is not working. Either they invited me or somebody in their family invited me and something is not working. So I may just start with one small thing. And because if I'm there in person, I should, I'll use the example, there's a pillow behind you. And let's say it's a lovely pillow, by the way. But if it were something that I perceived wasn't right, I would just say, let me just show you something. So I might take the pillow, put it behind my back or whatever and say, okay, now how do you perceive the space? It's Some people are just not visual or don't have an imagination. So it's mm -hmm. very hard for me to say, okay, if I were to move the pillow, you might get it, but somebody else may go, well, I, I don't know what the blue sofa looks like without the pillow. Mm -hmm. So if I can demonstrate it and they can feel like a shift and how they mm. perceive the space, they'll be comfortable to let me do something else. So if I can share an, an actual example of something that was very interesting. Sure. A contractor hired me to go visit a client that wanted some changes made in their home and they just wanted like an overall assessment. It was a very large home. And I, they limited my time, which was very difficult to do because I had to encompass a lot in a short amount of time. So as I was walking through the home, the homeowner was a husband and wife. The husband went off to do whatever he was doing. The wife kept following me and I, I didn't mind it, but she wasn't speaking, but she wasn't interacting, but she was following me. And I was making notes of what I was seeing when I ended up in the kitchen, I saw a picture of her. She was a chef. So she was dressed like a chef, you know, with the knives crisscrossed and everything. And I started using culinary language with her or said, mm. oh, the walls would look beautiful in a mango. And I started using terms that related to her profession and she walked away. Like she let me go. Mm. She let me do my thing because I figured out how to connect with her. Yes. There's a lot of psychology and intuition in this. And I'm grateful that I have the antennas for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so most of the time I'll pick up something that'll give me some language that'll help me relate better to the person or that the person can relate better to what I have to share with them. Yeah. Well, people's homes are so personal and so... I could see where, you know, if I thought someone was walking around my house, you know, critiquing things or whatever, I would kind of have like this, oh no, am I doing it right? Or is this the way it, you know, and, and maybe even, I don't know that I would be defensive, but I could see people being defensive, like, well, this is the way I want it, or this is, you know, important or whatever. I sometimes think that about people who I don't like a lot of collections of things and I don't. Uh, I don't like things setting around. I like like nice, clean spaces, you know, where there's not a lot of stuff around. But there are a lot of people, my mom is one of those, where there's just so much stuff everywhere. And if I say, well, why don't you pick two things that you really like and then not have these other things here or like even get rid of them, heaven forbid. And uh, <laughs> she is just, I mean, it's like I told her, she was the worst person ever. And I'm just like, I just wanted it to be easier or because you had to dust around all that stuff. And I mean, there's just like so much work and I don't know. So I know, like, I can imagine going into people's homes and talking about, you know, what's best to do could be, you know, they could get defensive about why they are doing certain things or why they have certain things. When you think about a kid 
if if a kid realized because most this you know my podcast is speaking to young people right. if a, if a young person feels like something in their environment we'll talk home right now but i kind of want to talk about school for a second but at home if their room is something that's kind of upsetting or i've had kids that said they didn't have a bedroom they only slept on the couch or things like that now i know sometimes that that is a a family situation, you know, maybe they're between homes or maybe they, there's so many people that live there and they only have two bedrooms or something like that. But what can a, a child or a young person who doesn't have the money themselves or, you know, they don't have the power to change these things just on their own, but what could they do or what are some small things they could do to maybe change their environment some? Yeah, that's wonderful. I would say, let's base it on the concept of creation. First, there was light. Mm -hmm. And lighting makes a world of difference. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of different bulbs around there. And there's some that I just cringe when I see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm not an advocate of, and I don't want to offend anybody that has them, but it's from a, a health standpoint. The there are some mercury bulbs that look like spirals. Mm. When I learned about those in part of my credits as a designer, we were told that if those break on the floor, you're supposed to call a hazmat team at a store. Oh, my. Why are those being sold to homes? They actually have as much or more mercury than the fluorescent tubes that we see in schools and offices. They're very toxic from a oh sense standpoint and from a health standpoint if you have them please don't crack them i had a client i said what do you do with your mercury light bulbs he goes oh i just crack them in half and on my knee and then i throw them in the dumpster oh, oh no <laughs> please don't do that take oh, them to goodness. the big store and they have ways of disposing them, whatever they do, that's no longer our responsibility, but at least we're right. trying to do the right thing. So there are LED bulbs and lights that mm -hmm. can adjust the temperature. So it's really the, the temperature. We want to bring it as close to natural sunlight as possible. So mm. there's some light bulbs that are one company calls them reveal and there's like a little sliver of a rainbow on them like a spectrum mm. and those give you could be in a room without light like you were telling me in previous employment where there were mm. no windows you're looking around for a window because it's so realistic so mm. just that alone if you could change your light bulbs to have them in a in a warm natural tone not too cold because then it's like a surgical environment mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's very very harsh and then it's like looking at your phone all day long right oh, okay mm -hmm. so lighting would be my first thing also if possible not everything needs to be out at the same time mm -hmm. uh, which is hard so if it's a collection that's great then group it but I know teenagers are famous for throwing things on the floor. It doesn't bother them. They walk right over them, no problem. Mm -hmm. But it's really, it's not even a matter of this is my room and I do what I want in it. It's really the noise that it creates. So if it's possible mm -hmm. to put it away, bins in the closet, whatever it is. So the less stuff, the calmer you will be. And I'd say those would, would be like the least... And there, what a lot of what I do, so I'm thinking about 20 things at once. There's not a lot of expense necessarily. It's mm -hmm. it's being open to letting go of things or to mm -hmm. put them away. That's when people are resistant. That is, it's they need it or it it has an emotional connection or I need to see that lamp or I need to have that pillow. Okay, well, we'll figure out how to do it. And there's a lot of resistance, obviously. I can't force mm -hmm. them to want to do that. But mm -hmm. once the room is set up, how it needs to be set up, just do like Carol and hairspray and spray the room and keep it that way. And you will feel so much better. It's also just maintenance. 
Is it always true that less is calming? I mean, because it feels that way to me because that is my preference. But when I think about like my mom, somebody who their whole lives have had a lot of stuff around them, is, is there such a personality or type or something that a lot of stuff would be not would be calming I don't know or it, it is because it has an emotional attachment okay so looking at the little collection of figurines let's say reminds me of so and so or when I lived in such a place or my trip mm -hmm. to this and it, it creates comfort okay when there's an emotional attachment to something and people would rather spend an hour dusting around them, mm -hmm. wonderful. If that makes you feel good, that's great. But okay. these are arranging collections, which I love doing. Um, <laughs> creating order of all the things that someone might have. And I turn it into art within what the things are in a bookcase or on shelves or whatever it might be. So there are ways of keeping it and working with it, or you could have a rotating collection. So this mm. month, I'm going to see what I bought when I was in Paris. Mm -hmm. it Next month, it's Italy or whatever it might be. You can oh, that's it such it. a great idea. I never thought about rotating collections. Maybe I could talk her into that because then she doesn't have to get rid of anything. <laughs> Museums rotate their collections. This is your museum and this is your art. So that is so fun. This, we'll this help will help my mom. She doesn't listen to this. I'll have to tell her about it. But that's so cool. Well, that made me think of something else. Oh, well, so when you work with people, it seems like it would work best if you're actually physically going to their home. And I'm guessing that is the case. That's how it used to be up until a couple of years ago. That sure. was my, I, I loved it and it was very effective. But I had to modify things. So let's say in the past, my business was 98% in person. And every so often someone would say, oh, my parents live in Tulsa. Could you walk us through? And I would. And so in the last couple of years, I had to just tap into that and reverse my thinking. I missed the interaction with people. And I missed touching your pillow and moving it to the right or moving it to the left. But if I do it online, then we're doing it right now live. I don't send you a list, do this, and I say, okay, please get up, you know, that pillow that's behind you, we'll put it on the chair to the right. So mm -hmm. I don't just, I will give you homework so that when we meet next time, I can see the progress and you can tell me how you feel, but it's not, it's not a one size fits all at all. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. So it is I, you know, personal, like you said. Yeah. yeah. And I, I always like in-person stuff way better than I do Zoom. But yeah, if we want to have, if we want to affect more people in the world and help more people, we have to do it online because we can't be in every state and every part of the world all the time doing these things. So um, I appreciate that. Now I'm thinking about my students too, that where a school environment is chaotic or agitating or I'm not really quite you know there's all sorts of words we could use for that but um, it's, yeah right and I sometimes kids can identify it like they would tell me well that room has too much stuff in it or I feel closed in when I'm there or but sometimes kids I think probably are reacting to something they don't even realize they're reacting to yeah. and so do you have any advice for how people can identify in their environment, especially young people at school, like how can they figure out that, oh, it's the classroom setting that, you know, the way the desks are or the color of the wall or the lights or, you know, something, how do they know that it's that and not just they got to get themselves figured out, you know, something within themselves? Well, it's both. I mean, if you walk into your classroom and go get me out of here, obviously mm -hmm. something's wrong and if there are issues. So it, it, I would kind of do a prequel scenario. There's obviously the child is saying, I can't stand to be in the classroom. So someone would have to walk them through or ask them questions like, okay, what color are the walls? What do the floors look like? 
can you send me a picture of how the desks are laid out? Obviously we can't control how the desks are laid out, but I could explain like, for example, the lighting. Mm -hmm. So these famous fluorescent lights. So they're not great. Now there are no more chalkboards, which I don't quite understand why that happened because they said the dust was toxic. Well, now you have these white reflective boards mm. that require magic markers and a foul smelling solution to wipe mm -hmm. them down, which is mm -hmm. far worse than whatever a friendly piece of chalk could have done to us. <laughs> and so the fluorescent light bouncing on the white board and then mm. hitting you back is very upsetting if the walls are white white contains all the colors of the spectrum at one time so your brain you might see white but the brain might register rainbow a thousand million times so and then you mm -hmm. have a shiny floor with a checkerboard or something so just mm -hmm. the cube of the room without people without desks or anything is already challenging so there was a young lady that I was very friendly with personally. And so she was sharing what she had some very challenging times at school, but she was very self-aware. So we were able to talk through it. And so I suggested to her to get some colored glasses. Mm. So that would at least, doesn't matter what whatever color made her happy, to tone down the reflection. So it wasn't dark glasses and it wasn't like the teacher couldn't see her eyes or anything. It was mm -hmm. just a filter. Mm -hmm. well, there's a condition that I found out about while I was doing all my research to create sensor interior design called Erlen syndrome, I-R-L-E-N. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? I don't think so. So you might see people with like what I call little John Lennon glasses mm -hmm. with colored lenses and they look really funky, but a lot of them probably have Erlen syndrome. Okay. And it, it's not dyslexia, but it's a visual distortion, we'll call it. So sometimes the words might separate like bricks and mortar. Mm. So it might be, let's say the word happy and it'll be H-A-P split py oh okay and by using these glasses and just determining what color works best for you the mortar goes away and the happy comes together it's fascinating oh my gosh so it affects how you read so i figured out i had it so i have a filter on my computer sometimes when i'm reading out loud and i put a pale blue filter i read more fluidly when the filter is on it so these are just a lot of what I share with people are things that I discover about myself or people share. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just being able to filter out the brightness of the room would mm. be helpful. Okay. Well, and when you were talking about colored glasses or whatever, I was thinking about, I, I, I suppose it was this syndrome, but I just didn't remember the name of it. But I remember we used to have these colored plastic colored sheets that we would put on kids' papers. And it was partly because sometimes the white paper of a textbook is too glaring yeah. and that and that helped with that. But also it was helping them read sometimes. And it was probably this very reason why. And I remember we had different colors. So we would try, oh, here's a blue one. How does that work for him? Here's a pink That's one. How does that work for him? Whatever. And so it was probably that, but I just you know, I was thinking about just the color overlays and maybe not the actual what it what the what it was called that they had yeah. during that time. Well, I think that's so good for kids to know. I think it's good for teachers to know. I think it's good for parents to know. And so some of my audience is parents and maybe their child is struggling with a certain class or some classes, or maybe they're not sleeping at home, or maybe they're, you know, being depressed or like different things that they're kind of noticing and it could be the environment. So what could a parent, how could a parent start researching this or, you know, what could they maybe ask their child to find out, is it the environment and maybe some of this sensory overload stuff that's going on? Again, 
we may not be aware of what it is, but if like this girl that said, I didn't want to hurt my mom's feelings, I hate this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if there's another person involved that's a neutral party that's not mm -hmm. going to judge, or I promise I won't tell your mommy or <laughs> anything like that, but they may not be aware of it. What if their house is chaotic all the time? And for mm -hmm. the parents, seeing their child in a chaotic room is normal but what if that child has that sensitivity and really can't handle it mm -hmm. they're really going against the grain of what they know so I get questions I get emails I get things of how I can help people sometimes we speak on the phone they, they'll send pictures of videos and I'm able to help like this young lady I mean the minute the door opened I was like oh yeah I see it <laughs> <laughs> well, and now that you have all this experience, you kind of have like, oh, yeah, I totally get this. This is what, you know, I've seen some things like this before. Yeah. Well, so how would you like people that are listening to contact you if they have some questions or they want to send you a picture and say, what does this look like? Or, you know, how would you fix this kind of a problem? What would you okay. like them to do? First thing would be to get a hold of me and I give you the information in a moment and just ask to have a like a 20 minute conversation. I'm happy to hear what what the situation is and then we can talk through the options of how we can take care of the situation. Sure. Um, I do I'm very detailed so I ask a lot of questions I love when people ask me a lot of questions and again it, since it's not a one size fits all every person in every room is completely different mm -hmm. so my email address is sensory interior designer at yahoo.com so it's just the title of the person that does the work mm -hmm. sensory interior designer at yahoo.com perfect and, uh, just and we're like, going to put that in the show notes, by the way. So, I mean, I please write it down if you want to, but you'll be able to click on the link in the show notes so that you can ask your questions there or send, you know, just an inquiry about, hey, how do I do this? Or how can we set up a time or, or whatever? D what does it, is it helpful when, like, <laughs> I'm trying to think of like, I'm sure there are some homes where every single room has visual noise of some kind, but is it helpful to like maybe start in the bedroom of a child and like just do that one room and see how that goes and then you know maybe slowly progress through other areas or rooms as needed oh definitely and you know somebody might ask me to come and take a look at their den for example and mm -hmm. we'll discuss the den and when uh, they're comfortable enough with me i might ask them if i can visit their bedroom next time because mm -hmm. if I had my, my druthers, as they say, I would always start with someone's bedroom because if you don't, if you don't, let's say decompress before you go to bed and then sleep in a peaceful bedroom, tomorrow is going to be horrendous. So mm -hmm. if you don't prep <laughs> or so if I can help you sleep better and, and I've, collaborated with occupational therapists and we've had like webinars of how we kind of overlap in terms of preparing a child and everything slowly mm -hmm. and nurturing and then put in a lot of children that don't sleep in their room is because they can't stand to be in there oh wow if it's peaceful you'd sleep there mm -hmm. a lot of kids never spend time in their room during the day and they don't know it so would you like to be left in a room you're not familiar with mm. nope. nobody would right so bedrooms really are for me is the starting point i'm gonna see it like a j like it starts at the bottom and then goes up we start at night so that the day can oh be. yeah that's a great idea. Well, I hear from most parents that their kids won't ever come out of their room. <laughs> so now maybe the rest of the house is not <laughs> relaxing. And so their room is their sanctuary. And I think sometimes it is like, that's the place where they can get away from the things that they don't want to be dealing with. And so I guess if a parent has that question, maybe then you could start looking at, well, what else is going on outside of the room? Exactly. Uh, and 
that is, you know, maybe upsetting or, or, you know, too much of a sensory overload. And then one thing we didn't talk about, but something you could talk with someone about too, is their work environment, like their workspace and what it was like. I was telling you before we started recording about my, it didn't affect my work, but I didn't like working in um, an office that had no windows. And for 14 years, I worked in that office that didn't have windows. And there are many classrooms in the world that do not have windows, especially in the school I was at. I mean, your outside classrooms had windows, but you had a lot of in, in the building classrooms that did not. And yeah, it's, it's, I mean, there's no way you can fix, have a window when there's no window. I mean, there was no way to get any sunlight to my office, but I did have a happy light that I had in, and that's actually what it's called happy light, but it was like having the sunshine shining. And sometimes the kids, when they came in, they would say, how come you have that bright light? And I'm like, well, it's like this, it's like my window. And so there are ways to fix even that if you yes. don't have access to a window. So if you have, if you're in an office on your own or you have an office mate that you could collaborate on this, I recommend turning off the lights, the overhead mm-hmm. fluorescent lights, mm-hmm. putting in some lamps with the oh, yeah. healthy light bulbs. I love happy lamps and people with seasonal affective disorder Mm -hmm. um, are highly affected by that. And so if you can have a happy light or a full spectrum light, like I mentioned, your mood Mm -hmm. will change. You'll be more productive, more focused. Just like I said, lighting is really crucial to correct things. So get rid of that fluorescent vibe (laughs) in every sense of the word and bring in some incandescent light or something that will reproduce incandescent light. Mm, That's such a good idea. And I think this might be really with parents that are really worried about some of these things. Some of these things are so simple to check, you know, just changing the light bulbs or taking some things and putting them away or just taking some things out of the room and maybe putting them in a different room or something. And you could always test it. You could test the new light bulbs and see, okay, did that make any difference? Okay. Well, that didn't seem to work. Let's, you know, check on something else. But I think this is just good for us to get this information out there for people to start thinking about, oh, the environment may have a huge effect on why my kid's not doing their homework or they're not sleeping or they're not doing well in a certain class, or for my, for my young people listening, you know, the way they have things set up in their room or how things are going could, could be why they don't feel so good or why they don't want to go to school or why they, you know, thinking about environment and not just thinking about themselves, because I think we tend to think, well, what's wrong with me that I can't handle this or what's wrong with me that I can't sleep or what's wrong with me that I can't read this passage or understand what's going on, but it could be something outside of us that is getting in the way of that. And so I, I think it helps take some of the pressure off of our own selves. Like what's wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with you. Try to figure out how do you work with your environment or work with those things. So well, I am so glad that you joined us today. This was just so good for me. And I want, I'm definitely going to be in your community, finding out more and more about what you, what you do, but is there anything else you want to share with my audience, the young people and, or the parents? Yes. Thank you. And it's actually what you were just saying about what's wrong with me In reality, nothing is really wrong with you. I'm, I will share about myself. I'm what is known as a highly sensitive person which at times is a blessing, but sometimes it isn't. Mm -hmm. And I pick up all this stuff. So I'm not the only one out there that's affected by it. So a lot of people build up a filter or block all this stuff, but it's coming at everybody. So some people can eat spicier food. Some of us Mm -hmm. can't. It's, It's the same thing. And if you feel nervous when you walk into a space or you say, get me out of here, I can't stand it, chances are you're part of the club. And Mm -hmm. and it's a wonderful thing because then you know what to work towards. And you, like you Mm -hmm. say, with the light bulb, you can experiment. When I first started giving the 
my seminars, I used jelly beans as an example and said, you know, classrooms for young children, the concept is primary colors and they're exciting and everything, but would you give your little four-year-old breakfast, lunch, and dinner just mm -hmm. jelly beans? Because mm -hmm. the effect is exactly the same. We go way up, it's a high, and then we crash. Mm -hmm. And the wrong environment has the same effect on us. It's exhausting. So I'm affected by people's energy, and I'm affected by the energy in a room. So it's, mm -hmm. it's legitimate. So, yeah, I have a glossary on my website also about all these different terms that you can mm. learn about. Uh, empath and highly sensitive people and so forth and yeah our website is thegoldtouch.net so we mm. also have examples there and a little more explanation and some before and after pictures I have some I don't have to decide that's my collection how do I rotate that <laughs> Oh, and I will say to my audience, you need to check these before and after pictures out because I'm not somebody that my environment bothers me too much. I can pretty much be flexible and, and I can still be productive in almost any setting. But I looked at those pictures and like the before just looked like a cute, you know, like, oh, the, I would want my room to look like that. And then the after didn't, but it's because for me, having a lot of crazy colors or a lot of stuff on the walls or whatever I probably wouldn't think that much about it but for someone who was sensitive to those things it was too much and so you might be thinking and this is the example of your mom who painted a room as a gift to her daughter but she didn't paint it a color she talked to her about and so she didn't like the color but you know what we sometimes think for our children oh this room is so cute I made it you know has all these colors it has all this stuff going on how fun but your child may not think, or maybe not even realize they don't know that it's the way the room is painted or the things on the walls that are actually causing the agitation. And so it's just something to be think thinking about. And I'm just so glad that this has been brought to, to our attention because I think it's something we need to pay attention to. And I have two grandchildren now. So now I'm thinking about their rooms, like, hmm, <laughs> I have to make sure that their rooms are not going to be too stimulating for them. So there's an experiment. They put a very placid baby in a yellow room and they left the baby alone and the baby started crying because color has a frequency. Oh my God. And so yeah, we have to be very careful. I use culinary terms again. A little bit of spice goes a long way. And there are certain colors that are very, very spicy. And we really have to keep it down. Oh, I love that. Well, I need to know more about this too. So, well, thank you for being with us today. Well, I have you. loved every second of it. And it's given me more stuff to think about and more stuff to research. I'm a learner. That's one of my top five strengths. I love to learn new things. And I'm always like trying to find the more information about everything. So this will give me some more information to do. And I'll put all your stuff in the show notes. And I think there's even books and everything else. And so I will put all that out so people can check it out. And thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It was a great pleasure talking to you. Sure.